Good morning. A veteran's home in Missouri City is getting some much needed repairs right now. Last winter's freeze damaged Harry Arrington's home. The makeover is all thanks to Spencer Solves It. This morning, Bill Spencer, photojournalist Cesar Martinez, along with a team of volunteers, are working hard to help put this home back together. We will be tracking the progress throughout the hour. Look at that. And now to a home that was dropped in the middle of a North Houston road. A couple says they were trying to relocate their mobile home to a trailer park and a paid towing company to move it. But during the move, they say that a tow truck's hitch broke and three tires popped, sending their home flying into the middle of the road. You can see work is being done as we speak to move that home. That might be part of it moving right now, a truck moving some of the debris. The home has been in the road for more than 12 hours. Well, it was five years ago today, the community of Santa Fe was changed forever. It was May 18th, 2018. A gunman walked into Santa Fe High School with a gun. He shot and killed eight students, two teachers, and injured 13 others. This afternoon, a monument will be unveiled for the victims and survivors. Brittany Jeffers has what we can expect from today's ceremony. This is something that forever changed this community and the families that live here. Now, organizers say that this monument that will be unveiled is an ode to the survivors. Now, if you take a look at this video, it shows the base of this statue that is wrapped up. Now, it will be fully revealed during that remembrance ceremony this afternoon. It's called Warrior Spirit, and the chair of the Memorial Foundation says that it will stand roughly 12 feet tall in front of the high school in memory of those who died in the massacre five years ago. So Warrior Spirit will hold um, a spear into the air with 10 eagle feathers representing each of those we lost. But Warrior Spirit is really an ode to the community, to the survivors that, that were there that day. Um, it's a respectful representation of those that have endured great tragedy. Um, and it shows their courage, their bra bravery, and of course, their Warrior Spirit. Now, this day forever changed the community of Santa Fe for families who lost loved ones, but also for survivors. Sonia Lopez's daughter, Sarah Salazar, was a sophomore at the time of the shooting. She was shot in the shoulder and underwent eight surgeries. She says to this day, her daughter is still healing. Well, five years later, um, my daughter, Sarah, is um, still at home. She's not wanting to go to college at this time. Uh, she doesn't want to talk about it. And so um, she's just sitting at home. She uh, feels depressed and she still has the PTSD. So the ceremony as well as the unveiling of this statue will be taking place at 430 today at the high school in Santa Fe. I'm Brittany Jeffers, KPRC 2 News. Brittany, thank you. The man accused of killing five people in San Jacinto County is headed back to court this morning. 38-year-old Francisco Oropesa is accused of shooting and killing five neighbors. He is being held on a $7.5 million bond. He is set to return to court at 8.30. There are renewed calls for change at Harris County Jail after a sixth inmate died while in custody this week. 32-year-old Robert Terry suffered an apparent medical emergency. Officials say Terry asked to be taken to the jail clinic right before he collapsed. We spoke to Sheriff Ed Gonzalez about what's being done to prevent future deaths within the jail. As we've already said before, it's the same thing. We're committed to trying to review everyone. Every death is unique. We also spoke to the executive producer of Texas Jail Project. She says 190 inmates have died at Harris County Jail since 2009. During that same time frame, 160 inmates have been executed, so less. Texas Commission on Jail Standards has previously said Harris County Jail is deficient in terms of overcrowding, long inmate stays, and inmate deaths. The commission also says the jail struggles to retain detention staff. And the point I'm trying to make is that jails, our county jails, have become um, 
a death sentence is to reduce overcrowding. Because un unless we can reduce the population in the jail, they will not be able to address people's medical needs. According to records, Terry had no physical injuries and died before his court appearance, which was scheduled for Wednesday. The Texas Education Agency is going to tell us more about what the transition of Board of Managers is going to look like as it takes over Houston ISD. The agency first announced it was going to take over the district after the state said HISD had low performing schools. KPRC2 reporter Corley Peel is live outside Houston ISD headquarters with how the takeover has gone so far. Corley. Good morning, Zach. This transition has sparked a lot of emotions from parents to HISD. And just last week, the HISD Board of Trustees held their final meeting. And many say that they're still going to make sure that there's transparency and that the public has all the information they need about this transition. Now, this morning, TEA plans to give a presentation about the transition to a board of managers. The board of managers and superintendent are expected to be selected by June first. So far, there have been 463 for the board of managers or applicants for that board. 225 of those applicants have already participated in training. It's unclear if we could learn today who is actually going to be on the board of managers, but the new board will replace the locally elected Houston ISD Board of Trustees. The board of managers will be in charge of school board duties. That includes approving school budget, tax rate, setting district policies in areas like school safety, safety and instruction that is allowed under state and federal laws. Now, Zach, that meeting starts at 930 this morning and we will be there. Zach. Yeah, a lot to talk about during that meeting. Do we know if the public will have an opportunity to speak? <clears throat> Zach, they will. Uh, the community members were asked to sign up yesterday if they wanted to have a moment to speak or ask questions, but we will be hearing from the community and parents this morning as well. Corley Peel live for us this morning. We appreciate it, Corley. Thank you. The U.S. government has updated its guidelines to allow more people to donate blood. Under the new rules, all potential donors would need to complete individual risk assessments regardless of gender or sexual orientation. Cameron Palmer with Gulf Coast Regional Blood Center is here to tell us all about these guideline changes. Thank you so much for coming in this morning oh, thank you. to chat with us. We know this is something that we've been talking about for quite some time now. Why hasn't it happened? When is it going to happen? <laughs> it's happening now. It is happening now. Uh, you know, the FDA released this new guidance, you know, with a, a targeted based questionnaire, which is now looking at the sexual behaviors of a donor versus the sexual identity or the sexual uh, preference of a donor. And this is going to ease a lot of restrictions, especially in our LGBTQ community. Uh, gay and bisexual men are now going to be able to donate blood, which is a huge step in creating a lot of, you know, equality within our donors. What will this do for the blood supply? You know, we're, I'm not sure if it will actually like show an increase in the blood supply, but it will open doors to those communities that have been deferred in the past. And, and, these, and these are people who are healthy. They're healthy within their communities that would be eligible to donate. Absolutely. You know, we always are looking for healthy donors right. to come in and donate blood. And, you know, this is just, like I said, another step forward just to creating, you know, equality within our donors and treating everybody fairly because, you know, there are donors out there that are perfectly healthy and, you know, we should be able to accept them to donate blood. We know for many years there was a lifetime ban. That lifetime ban was lifted back in 2015. It was then put in place uh, an, uh, an abstinence period. Uh, I think it was a year. It was at a that year, point, correct. Right? That was then relaxed during the start of the pandemic in 2020 to three months. Correct. And now we're at the we're at the next we're in the next chapter. We're going into the next chapter. Do we have any time frame as to when this will be implemented? Well, right now, you know, all the blood centers around the uh, nation are working as fast as they can to implement the new changes, including Gulf Coast Regional Bullet Center. You know, we are prioritizing this new change and, you know, we're hoping to start, you know, welcoming uh, donors in soon. What is the current need in our community? Well, you know, right now we need about a thousand donations every day just to meet the daily need. You know, there's people all over the community, including the world. People come to the Texas Medical Center for their treatment, and we need about a thousand donations for everything from chemotherapy to people going through surgery, trauma victim. You know, there's people, you know, have trauma in their family every day, and it's the community that comes together and donates blood to actually help those people. It's the largest medical center in the world. Uh, that need is great. Um, 
during summer months, we typically see an increase in need, right? Is see that, a decrease. A uh, decrease. A, a increase in need, a decrease in the in donors, in donors yeah, correct. Yeah, so now is the time. If you at home are you know, contemplating, now is the time. If people watching right now, listening right now, want to get involved, how can they go about donating for the first time? You know, just go to our website at giveblood.org. We have neighborhood donor centers all over the greater Houston area. We have mobile drives that are going on every day. So uh, giveblood.org is a great place to find and schedule a location for donation. This is a conversation that we're very passionate about. We hold and host blood drives uh, with you in, in coordination with you. Um, the need is great. During the six o'clock hour on the morning show, we introduced our audience members to Joanne, um, she, Joanne Thomas. Oh, she's wonderful. And, and we got in touch with mm -hmm. Joanne through you, and she's a wonderful woman. But you know, it was through her story that we hit home the need and how people uh, rely on the, on this blood, and it can truly save lives. Absolutely, and that's just one person, right. one person that you met that needed blood, and there are thousands of people, you know, every day that are in need of blood. So just coming out and making that donation, it really impacts your community, and it's an easy way to give back to the community. And it's a great way to find out what blood type you are. Absolutely, as well. if you if you don't know your blood type, it's a great way. That's the fun part of it all, <laughs> right? And Absolutely, then, and then of course the snacks that come with it. Oh, well, everybody loves a snack. Cameron Palmer, <laughs> thank you so much for coming in. Thank you morning. so much for having me. We do appreciate it. Okay, our Bill Spencer is working to help rebuild a Vietnam veteran's home, helping him a huge team of volunteers. Check that out. We are tracking their progress uh, on KPRC 2 Plus now. You can see they are working hard, trimming trees. They'll be mowing the, la uh, the grass. I know they pressure wash the outside. There's Bill right there with a mop. There he is. I I'm wondering if he just got done mopping. <laughs> we'll be checking in with Bill in just a few moments.